Good afternoon. Um, my name is Neil, and I'm excited to share with you today our work on tackling GPU memory bottlenecks for real-time video analytics at the edge. This work was done with my collaborators at Princeton University, UCLA, Zhejiang University, and Microsoft Research. In recent years, real-time video analytics has been crucial in enabling and guiding a wide range of applications. And at the heart of executing video analytics queries is their machine learning pipelines. Live camera feeds are streamed to a set of servers and GPUs, where machine learning models run on each frame in real time, locating and characterizing objects with high accuracy. Now, the goal with these pipelines is to maximize query accuracy subject to latency SLAs and resource constraints. Now, traditional deployments shipped camera feeds over the wide area network or the cellular network to the cloud. However, due to growing camera deployments and increasingly stringent latency targets, these ML pipelines are moving to the edge. Companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and NVIDIA have developed lightweight compute boxes specifically designed for the edge that can be placed in a way that provides low latency connectivity to multiple cameras, say at an intersection. And so these edge boxes are now responsible for ingesting and processing multiple camera feeds. As with any shift to the edge, there are pros and cons. On one hand, this sidesteps the network bandwidth and latency overheads of going to a potentially distant cloud. On the other hand, you're forced to rely on compute resources that are strictly inferior and less elastic than their cloud counterparts. To better understand the implications of shifting these pipelines to the edge, we studied a pilot video analytics deployment in collaboration with two major US cities targeted at road traffic monitoring. Here we considered 12 different cameras from two different metropolitan areas. Like any other video analytics fra a framework, analysts register queries to run on an edge box. A query is composed of a model, a task, and the camera feed to run. Collectively, the set of queries and models to execute on a single edge box is known as the workload. In practice, we find that tens of camera feeds are directed to a single edge box with tens of queries being issued on each feed. And this is a partial sample of one of 15 different workloads that we use throughout this work. These workloads are typically executed like any other model inference serving platforms. As frames stream in, corresponding models are sequentially executed on the frames in real time. Now, in order to process a frame with a model, the model's weights need to have been loaded into GPU memory. These weights correspond to the set of values that parameterize the model's different layers of computation. And these layers wake up, make up the most of a model's memory profile. So all of these models need to have been loaded into GPU memory. However, we are finding that the total amount of GPU memory required by all of the models in these workloads is exceeding the GPU memory available at the edge. Here I plotted the total GPU memory consumption of each of our 15 different workloads with respect to the GPU memory available in today's commercial edge offerings. The two different colors correspond to different batch sizes, and tip operators typically use larger batch sizes to process more frames at once and decrease inference latency. So now not only do many of these workloads currently exceed available GPU memory, this limitation is only going to get worse with time as workloads grow to include more camera feeds, more queries, and larger and more complex models. Scaling the amount of GPU memory at the edge to meet these growing workloads is challenging due to the physical constraints of the edge environment. So one way to deal with insufficient GPU memory at the edge is to timeshare the model execution into the GPU by swapping the model in and out of GPU memory. And you can use any off-the-shelf swapping scheduler here, but the idea is when there's a not enough GPU memory to concurrently house multiple models, the models are continually swapped in and out of GPU memory. However, when applied to our workloads, we find that these techniques result in skip processing of 19 to 84% of frames and corresponding accuracy drops of up to 43%. 
The reason is that the cost of repeatedly loading models into GPU are prohibitive and often exceed the corresponding inference times by as much as 30x. As a result, these systems are unable to keep up, keep up with the incoming frame rate and must drop frames due to SLA violations. So given that operators are increasingly faced with this dilemma of preserving query accuracy for workloads while dealing with the limited GPU memory available at the edge, our work asks, what can we do to reduce these GPU memory bottlenecks? And while there's a whole body of work on individual model compression, we often find that this comes with unacceptable accuracy violations and requires domain-specific hand tuning. So instead of looking for memory reduction opportunities within a model, we look if we can exploit redundancies across models. And our key finding is that despite that workloads consist of a diverse set of vision models, many of them share layer architectures. Layer definitions. By layer definition, I mean the actual computation or function governing the layer, not the specific weights. So by saying two layers have shared definitions across models, I mean the equations are the same. For example, if I take the faster RCNN model and train it on two different data sets, Every layer definition is shared across the models, but the weights would be different. But importantly, we find that these shared layer definitions do not just occur in these simple cases where the model architectures are exactly the same. They appear across different models in the same architecture family, as well as different models from different families of architectures. For example, on the left, I plot VGG16 and VGG19, and they share 16 layers. And on the right, VGG16 and AlexNet share three layers. More generally, across 24 different model architectures, we find that 43% of all pairs of different models have shared layers. We present a further detailed analysis in the paper. But generally, the main reason for these commonalities is that these considered models are vision processing deep neural networks, which employ the same series of common building blocks. So now consider our toy example, where we have three instances of shared layer definitions. Now say, for each of those definitions, you could find a single set of weights. What would the benefits be? Consider the same setup as before, but now instead of each model having completely independent and separate weights, some layers are shared across models. First, more models can concurrently fit into GPU memory. Only one copy of these unified weights need to be stored and loaded. Therefore, fewer model swaps are necessary. Further, this reduces the time it takes to load additional models because you no longer have to load all of the layers but rather just the ones that are not shared. The reason for these benefits is that by finding unified weights for different layers across models, you're reducing the number of parameters that have to be saved and loaded. And we find that per workload memory usage for our workloads drops by 17 to 86%. And by reducing the number of swaps and accelerating remaining swaps, we find that you can process 29 to 61% more frames and boost accuracy up to 50%. However, as you might be observing, achieving these benefits hinges on being able to find unified weights for layers across models with shared definitions. To do this, we propose, we propose model merging, where we jointly retrain the models in our workload such that some or all of their layers with these shared definitions use the same set of weights. And to do this, we can build on classic multitask training techniques. And for each layer that is shared across models, the optimizer only needs to hold a single copy of these weights. However, achieving these benefits is complicated by the fact that there exists an inverse relationship between the number of merged layers and the achieved accuracy during retraining. And the reason for this is when you merge a single layer across models, you're essentially compressing that layer's functionality across two models into a single set of weights. So the more layers you merge, the harder it is for the models to retain their overall functionality. Worse, determining the right layers to merge is further complicated by the fact that it's difficult to predict precisely how many layers will be shareable before accuracy violations occur, and each instance of retraining is costly. 
So GEM will tackle these challenges by introducing two key observations, and we'll describe each in turn. First, we find that memory is distributed unevenly across layers in vision models. Here we plot the cumulative memory percent consumption across layers for different models. And you could read the graph left to right, going from the first layer to the last layer. And the steep slopes in the memory consumption correspond to what we like to call heavy hitter layers, or layers that consume a large proportion of the model's memory. These layers are typically responsible for condensing low-level features into higher-level features. What this means is that instead of trying to share as many layers as possible, instead we can try prioritizing merging these heavy hitter layers in order to achieve significant memory savings and avoid the serious accuracy degradations that occur when sharing many layers. Further, you'll note that these heavy hitter layers generally appear later in a model's architecture. For this reason, computation reduction strategies that share early layers, or stems, won't work. Second, we empirically observe that the ability to successfully merge a layer is agnostic to interlayer dependencies. In other words, successfully merging a given layer will not be dependent on also merging other layers. And this is consistent with our previous finding that sharing more layers leads to accuracy degradations. And what this means is that we can try merging new layers independently, one at a time. And so building on these observations, GEMO follows an incremental merging process. It starts by selecting the heavy hitter layers and tries to merge them. If the resulting model meets the accuracy target, it incorporates the next heaviest set of layers and tries to merge them. If the resulting models do not meet the desired accuracy target, the algorithm skips that set of layers and proceeds to the next set. And so the final output of model merging is the models with the most amount of memory reductions, which do not violate the accuracy target. In essence, this approach aims to reap the most of the potential memory savings as quickly and with as few shared layers as possible. Putting everything together, GEML is composed of two main components, the edge and the cloud. The cloud component is responsible for automatically finding and exploiting merging opportunities across models using the strategy I just described. And at the end of each successful merging iteration, GEML ships the resulting merged models to the edge servers and carefully alters the scheduler to maximize merging benefits by organizing these models in a way that reduces the number of swaps and loading delays. The idea is you want to place models next to each other that share the most number of layers. We evaluated GEML on 15 different workloads I described earlier in today's talk, each featuring a different subset of camera feeds, architectures, objects of interest, and query types. In the interest of time, I'll focus on the first few axes of GEML's evaluation. First, we compare GEML against a baseline swapping system without model merging. We find that GEML improves accuracy by 2 to 60%, when the edge box's GPU memory is just enough to load the largest model in each workload. The origin of GEML's benefits is the ability to reduce the time blocked on swapping delays, which enables processing on more frames and without merging. You'll also notice that there's quite a bit of variability of accuracy improvements across these workloads, workloads 10 compared to workloads 1. The reason is that certain workloads are more bottlenecked by memory restrictions. In workload 10, loading costs are 66% of the computation costs, but only 15% for workload 1. GEML's memory savings range from 18 to 61% across workloads, and the corresponding raw memory savings are 150 MB to 5 GB. And this is significant, given that the GPU memory available in today's commercial edge offerings that we surveyed range from 2 to 16 GB. Further, we study GEML's benefits when independently varying frame rates, accuracy targets, and SLAs for a few different workloads. We find that as frames arrive quicker, when the FP FPS increases from 5 frames per second to 30 frames per second, GEML's wins increase because more inference is now required in a given time window, which in turn reduces tolerance to loading delays. As model accuracy targets drop from, let's say, 95% to 80%, GEML's wins increase because certain layers that fail to meet the higher accuracy targets during retraining 
are able to meet these lower accuracy targets and therefore deliver higher memory savings. As per-frame processing SLAs become more stringent from 400 to 100 milliseconds, Gemmel's wins increase because tighter SLAs imply that more frames will be skipped for a given swapping delay. The remaining components of evaluation can be found in our paper. In conclusion, Gemmel tackles GPU memory bottlenecks for real-time video analytics. It exploits redundancies across models to find unified weights for layers with shared definitions to provide memory savings and improvements in application accuracy. Our source code is available at this link. With that, thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions.